Let me just start with giving a brief introduction about what the foundation does, what's our area of work, and how do we go about achieving the objective and the mandate of the foundation. And then since the topic of the panel today was last mile connectivity, which as I have understood from Nicole is about how do we scale solutions and how do we scale them in the context of the scale that India has, uh, what have been our experiences and how we are trying to solve that problem. So um, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation is the private foundation of Michael Dell, uh, Michael and Susan Dell. Uh, the mandate of the foundation is to transform the lives of children living in urban poverty through education, health, and family economic stability. So in India, how that translates is um, we have three major portfolios, uh, the biggest one being education, and uh, the, the two others being financial inclusion, vocational and skilling, and childhood health. In education, uh, we've always taken a stand and you know, a firm belief that transformation in children's lives and especially transformation in our target segment, which is poor urban children, can only come about if children were achieving grade level competencies. It's not about basic literacy and numeracy. It's not about getting to school and you know, having a seat in the school. It's really about being able to reach grade level competencies and being at the same levels as children studying in private schools are, uh, which unfortunately is the state pan India that our schools, our government schools are way behind um, uh, are, are way behind private schools where most of the privileged kids are going. So, um, so that's, the, that's the simple mission that we started with. What can we do to create a quality education system for the children who are, work, who are studying in either government schools or in affordable private schools, but bring them to their grade level competencies, make sure that they're achieving the same, uh, the same level of competencies in math, science, language as their counterparts in better schools are. So the journey started with just figuring that out first. The journey started with just first establishing that impact, that you know, breaking myth number one, that the backgrounds that these children come from, the, the socioeconomic conditions of their families, et cetera, et cetera, these children, can they learn? And you know, can they come at the same level? So in the early years of the foundation's work, we've actually worked extensively in that area, working with several education organizations, both for-profits and not-for-profits, to actually establish that impact can be attained. Uh, not only can we attain the impact uh, in terms, you know, in a very measurable fashion, but their methods to scale and to replicate that impact. And now when I look upon those days, I think that was the easier part of the problem. Because the tougher part of the problem is actually how do you scale that across India? And how do you, you know, not do, do them in small lab experiments at the, at, you know, at the level of few hundred schools, but actually how do you do them for thousands of schools? And for that, you know, we've started almost a, a very different approach of systemic transformations where we've said that you know, we've found several organizations, several examples of, uh, of, of organizations being able to achieve impact for children's learning levels. So you know, there are several in India, most notably Gyan Chala, Nandi, Save the Children India, Bodh Chala, Pratham. You know, all of them are being able in some fashion to be able to create almost like outside school uh, lab set up, so to say, where children are, you know, where they're using new and innovative teaching methods, and children are achieving their grade levels. How do you how do you take that now to the millions of children in India who actually need uh, who actually need those solutions? And uh, and one of the obvious example uh, obvious answers to that is that it has to be delivered through the government education system because you know there are 1.1 million government schools in India as compared to 250,000 private schools in India, which are also delivering education at scale. But you know it, there is nothing compared to the already well established government education system that we have. So, so the problem that we really wanted to tackle was then, you know, how do we how do we take all these innovations, take them within the government education system, and deliver impact through the large infrastructure which already exists there? And what we learned in our very early days is just taking things from a from a pilot type of a setup, from a lab setup, you know, and really going from pilot to scale, a very traditional, you know, approach in management, in these schools, what we are taught just doesn't work in the government systems because the problems are not just classroom related. It's not just about the motivation of the teacher. It's not just about the, you know, the infrastructure that's available in the classrooms. It's much more of a systemic issue. And if we want to really solve that issue, we have to, we have to accept that and we have to solve for that problem. 
so that's when we, uh, you know, when we, we actually stepped back and saying that, you know, just doing several pilots, taking them to the, you know, taking them to the classroom and having them work through the same education system is not going to work. And what we need is to solve for several other systemic issues which exist in our, in our education system. So one of the examples that uh, you know that uh, we've is a journey that we've embarked upon with the state of Haryana is one which I think fits very well into this last mile connectivity theme. In this, in the state, we said that you know there was a there's there's just like any other state in India, very poor learning levels, several problems. But how do we go about changing it? So we, together with the state of Haryana, signed up for a five-year journey and set a very discrete target of improving the learning levels in the state of Haryana as per any third party assessment within a five year time frame. And, and almost I identified like what are the four pillars that we are going to work in. One of them is, um, is that the department overall does not have any academic agenda. It's an education department, but does not, you know, how many people in the education department actually know that the job and the primary job is not to, you know, count the number of toilets, not to build toilets, not to look about the infrastructure, the pupil-teacher ratios. It's actually to, you know, to improve and deliver learning outcomes for the children. And it's not, it's not a one-day journey, but it's a big cultural shift that needs to be done in order to establish accountability in the system in a fashion that it's all front and center towards educational outcomes. So that's number one. Uh, you know, establishing the, uh, the educational agenda in the team and bringing it back to very discrete measurement as well as, you know, very discrete methods of implementing it. The second is, you know, then really what are the supporting infrastructure that is required in order for that to be true? So, of course, you need, you know, basic MI system to be in place if you're talking about accountability. If you need to have the basic classrooms functioning, uh, you know, with teachers present over there, you know, not having too many single teacher classrooms, not have, you know, not, you know, at least have the basic infrastructure working. So, there's a second leg around saying what's the, <clears throat> what's the basic infrastructure that will be needed uh, to, in order for that to happen. The third thing is what are the multiple systemic issues which will continue to be there if you were just working at the classroom level. What, how will the monitoring system in the state change? How will the performance reviews in the state change? You know, do the teachers even know that you know, that what they're doing in the classroom is being looked upon by someone. Uh, how, how, how is basic provisioning happening in the state? So there's several of these basic uh, systemic issues which are, you know, around how the organization is structured, what is the academic ladder in the system and what's the administrative ladder in the system. So all of those were, again, you know, a big bucket of uh, initiatives that were bogging down the system. So that's almost like the third thing. And fourth is, of you know, of course, how will we change the classrooms? How do we come back to putting, you know, more data-based classroom assessments-based uh, systems in place? How do we include more activity-based learning? And that's probably the only bucket which, you know, multiple states have focused on, but, you know, forgetting the other three. So this sounds complex enough. And therefore, uh, you know, we had, we, we took a very different approach to solving this problem also, one which is usually not taken in, um, in state education departments is, I think, almost the only experiment of this kind or the only initiative of this kind. We hired the Boston Consulting Group to support the state directly in terms of putting this entire roadmap together, but then also being there with the state to actually uh, solve this problem. And have had huge success in the, in, you know, in the last one year in terms of having an MIS in place, having the data of 17 NAC children into the system, being able to put together a remedial pedagogy for the children, and you know, doing a lot of cultural shift to coming back and saying that you know, this is about improving the learning outcomes of children. And it's a journey which has just started for us, but I think the two things which we are realizing and which we as a group and, you know, it's great to have, you know, and, uh, you, know, an, if, you know, a forum like IIC to be discussing that is that is there two big gaps which continue to bog down such large-scale uh, system exercises, right? One is just the quality of talent which is available in these systems, the quality of talent and in the state governments themselves, but the quality of talent which is actually coming and willing to work with such large-scale systems in order to solve that problem. The second is that of data orientation. As more and more, you know, complexity starts coming into these programs, the, you know, the entire, uh, 
attitude towards using data, you know, the integrity of data and being very true to that is something that we just lack as a, as a system overall. And how do we solve for those two and what are the different methods that can be used to solve those two is, is something which we are still figuring out, but it will be great to hear everybody else's thoughts on, you know, how do we think we can include it in the education system and education reform that we are talking about. Let me take a pause with that and uh, hear from other fellow panelists, but would love to hear your thoughts and questions on our approach to do this. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm even more happy that, uh, and grateful uh, to, the, to the program for the wonderful work which Shirley and her team, I believe, are doing for us in the, in the, in the, in the skills agenda for government. It's, again, an accident of history that I came across them and that they're working for us, and therefore, I will make a few propositions for you today and then give a few examples to, to try and, 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 and convince you why my propositions are right. One is that political parties could win elections before are, tro are, are, are slowly but surely transforming. People are expecting service delivery. They are expecting their elected representatives to deliver bang for the buck. That, that with a rising middle class, with more incomes in the hands of people, with the aspiration levels of the poor uh, going up, and with a very young population, things in India are, are, are fundamentally changing. But what's the bad news? The bad news is that we have a, a civil service system which advises the political executive, which has had its training and its experience in a time where clientelistic politics and patronage really ruled the roost. Uh, it has its roots in colonialism, but I think that's no excuse. We've had enough experience in post-colonial administration, and therefore I think we are, we are far ahead of, of, of the problems of that time. But the problem today is, is, is actually a, a government system that's been shaped to deliver for patronage. So given both this good and bad news, uh, what is my proposition? My proposition is that much of the, of the, of the sort of uptake of uh, good quality pilots uh, are more an accident than design. Uh, and, and, and therefore, the, the, the problem that before us is that how do you plan for that accident? <laughs> the answer is you can do very little especially in the short time frameworks that people who fund pilots normally have. Who funds pilots? I'm not talking of pilots who fly Indigo Airlines or Air India, but pilot uh, 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 programs that we do. Typically, they are foundations. They are bilateral donors. They are, are, are multilateral donors. Uh, and... Uh, 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 and some pilots, by the way, are also undertaken by government with a, with, with, with a purpose of understanding how things will pan out. But the problem with all of these people, including government pilots, is actually a lack of patience. And also a problem with design. Now, the, the only category of people here, and it's not because the Susan and Dell Foundation is here, is, is just because I find that foundations have a much greater appetite for risk-taking they're able to, uh, to, 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 to lie in wait for, for, for opportunistic moments to pounce upon the prey. But what they lack is a certain reach within the sort of policy machine and the, the, the networks to be able to make their, their good ideas heard and acted upon. Now, let me, let me, let me sort of, uh, these were my propositions. So, so let me uh, try and give you two examples that I, uh, that I have. Uh, one is from Bihar, uh, which uh, we did uh, with the, uh, with the uh, I work very closely with Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflu and Rohini Pandey. I'm sure competition to Chicago, but nevertheless, in the global public goods sector, they are collaborators. Uh, the point being, that what we did was we demonstrated, we believe, quite conclusively, and again by sheer accident, through a very large RCT, uh, that if you change the way that government funds its programs, you can have a fiscal deficit reduction of one lakh crores. Now, for those of you who have flown in from outside India yesterday, 
one lakh has got five zeros. Now you convert it to your millions. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, so government can actually reduce the fiscal deficit by one lakh crores at a very minimum. And you can reduce corruption by 25%. We finally have a number on that. And how did we do this? This we did be, uh, when uh, uh, using the uh, use case of the Mahatma Gandhi uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, where, as you know, we have an employment guarantee. It's a very large program. 25 to 30,000 crores of rupees are spent annually on it. It ranges, again, from year to year. But broadly, that's the ballpark number. And all we did was that we demonstrated through an RCT that rather than give money in advance, if the money is actually kept in a central pool, and when the payment is to be made to a worker, if that bill, and actually payments in government are through bills, and if that bill is actually uploaded in the public domain, and then the money is paid, uh, uh, the money is drawn from the account, uh, uh, in the in in, a, in the same sort of time frame as it's uploaded, then the sort of public the threatened public scrutiny will have a sanitizing effect, and therefore you will have a reduction in in corruption. Now the accident bit of this is that this is not what we were chasing. I was really struggling as principal secretary rural development, and I was you know, five minutes up. Okay, uh, five minutes up or five minutes more? It's the same because I have ten minutes. Yes. <laughs> So, 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 so what we were chasing is the inability of, of, of the poor state of Bihar with so much poverty and with so much incentive for people who are operating the scheme because, you know, uh, Narega is a wonderful scheme because you can loot it beautifully and everybody will be happy. The worker will be happy because he gets additional income. The engineers will be happy because they'll get additional income. The principal secretary will be happy because he'll get promoted. His ACR, his annual performance will look good. So it's everybody is happy down the line, yet there is 70% rationing. So people who want, 70% of them can't get the benefits of this scheme. So we were trying to ease the financial constraint by actually doing this. But what did we have? We had a dramatic 25% reduction actually in offtake. So we were actually crestfallen till we looked very closely at the data and we also, also mounted a 6,000 household survey as to what happened to your own incomes. And we found that a 25% reduction in scheme uptake, uh, spending had no impact on, on, on household uh, uh, income effects, uh, which was a dramatic result. Then IS officer, 30 years in government, comes to Government of India, works with Abhijit and Nestor and Rohani, the best guys you can get in the thing, and we are pitching to government, say, listen, we can get a 1 lakh crore reduction in deficit and if we simply you know, expand this effort you know, across the 3 lakh crore spending that you have. And what, did, and what do we get? A blank look. People think, the bureaucrats think it's too complicated and too risky. The politicians think it's a great idea, but who's going to implement it? Now, so, so, so what is required here is actually another huge effort at actually gradually watching the system, spinning it, uh, 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 pouncing upon opportunities to then build a consensus around to grab this idea and to unpack it in such a way that is actually shown to be as simple as it actually is. But nobody's willing to support it because this was supported by three, i.e., they had a project, all the boxes were ticked, they even had a seminar for policy uptake, you know, where they were invited policy makers, nobody came, they presented to themselves. And they tick the box, key policy influence attempt, ho gaya. it's been done. There's also an incentive problem for, 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 for academic researchers because they have to get a paper out there, uh, a good quality paper, a good quality journal, fantastic, they're, they're out of the box. And as far as uh, 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 the, 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 the politicians are concerned, they have a five year, uh, two minutes, they have a five year window. Uh, of which the first year is really, or, or maximum second year is when you can really do great things, risky stuff. But in India, even that's killed because the national elections is one thing and you have state elections happening all the time. We are, we are in perpetual election mode. And therefore, our ability to do risk-taking behavior from a political standpoint is, 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 is very limited. Now, let me give you another example in the next two minutes that I have 
where, and this is really, according to me, the graveyard of pilots. And again, it's Abhijit who is the, is the graveyard. And we work very well together, it's a different point, but I vehemently disagree with some of the things he does. And he came across this and said, he said, we have to do asset building for the ultra poor. That's the only way in which we can deal with the people who are the ultra poor. So he ran this fantastic pilot in six countries of the world where he demonstrated the great effects of asset transfers to the ultra poor. But then the problem with the entire design of those pilots was that that's a pilot that can never be replicated to scale in government because this is something which we have tried to IRDP in the past in India. You need actually a very highly motivated NGO, a group of people who will ensure that the assets are of quality, who would handhold over an extensive period of time. And these are, these are things that you can never get to scale at in, in large bureaucratic processes and delivery systems like the ones India has. Currently, I'm sure it will change. As I said, the good news is that politics is changing. But till such time, you cannot have pilots that are designed to be pilots to ever be upscaled. Therefore, the point I'm making here is that uh, even if you, A, is that we have a problem with the design of pilots because the design itself is to be a pilot. And, and the second is that, and that's, that's, that's a necessary condition. So even if you get that right and you've actually done something which can be scaled up because the design parameters are right, then you are struck by the other problem of the accidents of history that needs to happen, which really means, it really is not an accident. I was trying to mislead you. It's just that you need to have that time period of, 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 of so-called inactivity, where you're strategizing, where you're planning, and you're ready to pounce. You have to lie in wait like a tiger waits for its prey, Building the networks, and in India, building networks is very easy because there is just that 20% of people who do musical chairs within the government system who anyway do reforms and others don't. So the point is, how do you identify them? How do you work with them? How do you share? Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you ensure they know what they needs to be uh, uh, known so that you're able to pounce at the right time? So that's all I'd like to say now. I'd be happy to take questions. But just to sum up, the point I'm making is that even if you get your design, A, the pilot designs have problem. Two, even if you have a design problem solved at the pilot stage, the uptake is a long and arduous task that needs to be funded, that needs to be supported, and then you have a, fair, a, a fairly reasonable chance of succeeding. Thank you. So for everybody else, today I'm going to share with you a piece of technology, a new piece of technology that I think will quite honestly amaze you. You know, we all want the latest smartphones, the, the wafer-thin tablets, the, the things that fly planes. But I'm pretty certain that none of you have these. Now these are real phones. These are real phones that are being used in rural Bihar right now. Notice the brands. There's a, a Nokai. There's a Tintele, we've seen Simsangs. Now, let me tell you why these devices are so special and why they're actually going to be critical in saving lives. It's easy to get really excited about advanced technology and about how you know, technology can transform our lives, how it can challenge the way we think about solutions and about possibility. Um, techno technological progress is unstoppable. I mean, we're all, you know, we're all aware of it. It's around us all the time. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is how, what we can do with what we have today, what's already available. And I don't mean what you and I have available today. What I mean is the people who have no access to information, the people who don't have access to the internet, the people who are not watching television, who are not listening to the radio, but who have phones like these Nokais and Tinteles. How can technology change their lives? So in Bihar, BBC Media Action has worked for the last four and a half years, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, on a project called Shaping Demand and Practices that aims to save the lives of mothers, newborns, and infants by increasing both demand for health services and shaping norms around uh, healthy behaviors. Now, we do this by leveraging every single touch point uh, to reach people. And that means using things like radio, it means using things like video vans, community-based groups, self-help groups, street theater, you name it. It also means using mobile phones. Now, Bihar has 104 million people, of which there are about 26 million women of reproductive age. 
And data tells us that only 18% of these women are actually watching television. Shockingly, only 12, 11% listen to the radio. Now for an organization ha that has the BBC in its name, that's a particular challenge that is, you know, it's quite large because we're known to be a mass media organization. Clearly, you know, using legacy media, using traditional media was never going to get us where we needed to go uh, in Bihar. But what research also told us was that 82% of people in Bihar had access to a mobile phone. And we added to this 200,000 health workers, frontline health workers, who are vital in reaching women in their homes. It's part of their jobs, it's part of the service delivery that the government system set up. And when you put all of that together, there are some ingredients there for a solution. Now, frontline health workers, for all of us who are familiar with, with rural India and with the health system, you know, they're women from the community. They're Bhabi next door. And they can often struggle to get their messages across, to convince women in the community that they know what they're talking about. They're often educated only up until the high school level, if at all. Uh, they're inadequately trained on communication. And they're not taken seriously by the families that they visit. They want training and they want tools that will enable them to do their jobs more effectively and more efficiently. So we looked at appropriate technology, that's the Tintele, uh, and we found very encouragingly that virtually all frontline health workers in Bihar either owned or had access to a mobile phone. But at the same time, we found that only 9% of them had ever sent a text message. Now, that sent a very clear message to us so while frontline workers had phones and they were using them, they were only using them to make and receive phone calls, nothing else. So we knew based on this research that we needed to develop something really simple, something that was audio-based, something that was accessible, and something that avoided uh, the, the, the challenges of a lack of technical literacy. So in Bihar, we created, uh, starting three years ago, we created two mobile health solutions for uh, frontline health workers, and I'm gonna focus on one today. It's called Mobile Kunji, and Mobile Kunji is a job aid, and essentially it is this deck of cards on a ring, uh, 40 cards when we started out, it's now grown and expanded. Um, it's designed for use by the frontline health worker when she goes into the home to meet with the woman, her family, her mother-in-law, the husband, anybody else, and it has two components. So the deck of cards on the ring basically has, you know, a picture, sorry, I've gone too far, but a picture on the front um, with some messages for the, for the woman. And on the back, there are some key points of information that the frontline health worker must remember to deliver to the, the woman that she's meeting. Now, where's the innovation in this? And what's, the, what's this got to do with the Tintele handset in, in her left hand? The innovation in this, job, in this particular job aid is that every single card has at the bottom of it a unique toll-free mobile short code. And what that means is that the frontline health worker can dial that mobile number, that seven-digit number from her basic handset that makes and receives phone calls, and play for the woman she's visiting a piece of pre-recorded audio content that's linked to the content on the card that she's using with the woman. Now, the audio content is delivered by a character that we've created. This is Dr. Anita. She's, you know, uh, she's got great bedside manner, but she's the voice of authority. So, you know, she's... <laughs> now... It's incredible that we've been able to, after a lot of work, but we've been able to design something that, has, that is technology enabled, but has no complicated list of options to press or words to type. It's just a simple number to dial, and that takes us straight to the message that she's looking for. There's no mobile internet required. There are no fancy applications required. There's no handset dependency. There's no technology skills that are required. There's no big box of flip charts either. All she has to do is she has to make a phone call. Three years ago, we launched Mobile Kunji in Bihar. It's gone to several places since. But in those three years, we've had 270,000 unique users call the service, and they've played over 17 million minutes of content. That's usually, you know, that's, that's great uptake, uptake data, but essentially what it tells us as well, what our research tells us as well, is that frontline workers who use Mobile Kunji spend almost twice as much time with families as frontline workers who don't. In those visits, <coughs> women ask far more questions of their frontline health worker. And after those visits, they, the women tend to have more conversations with people in their families about whatever was discussed. So we're seeing that this is communication that's actually 
creating engagement, creating discussion, and going beyond just that first one-on-one -on -one engagement. We're also seeing, and mothers in Bihar are telling us this, that they have a greater respect for the health workers who use mobile kunji over those who don't. And they trust the information that health workers who use mobile kunji are giving them versus those who don't. We're also seeing that there's a definite correlation between exposure to mobile kunji through a frontline health worker and practicing specific healthy behaviors such as preparing for birth or uh, complementary feeding, initiating complementary feeding. This is all provisional data, it's top line data, and we're doing a lot more analysis right now on this study to, to find out more about how kunji works. And that's exactly what you were talking about, Mr. Matthew, is the time to be able to digest all of that and think it through and figure out what's going on. Now, in telling you about mobile kunji, I have some key takeaways for those of you who want to work with technology uh, to reach those who are seemingly unreachable. And I've tried to distill them into four or five specific points. One of the key values of the BBC is that, the audi is that audiences are at the heart of everything that we do. And we believe that it is absolutely critical to first and foremost identify and understand who you, who you want to reach. What are their lives about? What matters to them? Not just on health or the specific subject that you want to talk to them about, but what matters to them in general. It's important to get a complete picture of what drives their lives, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in, what their aspirations are, what they base their decisions on. So it's important to ask the right questions, to get the right research, to mine for insights, which is what you do once you've got the research, about your target audience. And you need to do all that before you design your intervention. Sherry Blair once said that it's not just about technology. The key, key to success is, con is content. And, you know, we couldn't agree more. It's absolutely critical to design content to get the kind of response you want. Communication is a stimulus. It's not messaging. Um, it has to be designed to be able to get you where you want to go. You've got to start unpacking messages into simple doable actions, into small bite-sized chunks. Don't preach, talk. Make content sticky, make it memorable, make it engaging, and speak in a style that's widely understood and accepted. And this means using language that's rich in idiom and in flavor. In order to ensure comprehension and retention for mobile kunji, we've really had to hone our craft. We've had to focus on voice casting, on the number of words in every single message, the length of sentences, the number of syllables in a word, the speed of delivery, sound effects. Every single detail contributes to the overall efficacy of the service. It's critical to design for scale. And particularly when it comes to mHealth, uh, services globally, we've seen a massive case of palliatitis. I believe that we have in these particular services been able to overcome palliatitis, and we've been able to do that by thinking about it very differently. So we haven't thought about it as a pilot that's meant for 500 fr frontline health workers, or 10,000 frontline health workers, or 40,000 frontline health workers. We started with 200,000 in Bihar, and the ambition is all of India. When you're thinking about scale like that, it's important to think about partnerships as well. It's important to think about how do you bring the right people into the mix. And there are three critical partners in taking anything that's technology enabled to scale. You've got to have the private sector. You have to work with the mobile network operators. There's very little way around that. You have to work with the government because nobody can do scale without the government in this country. And you have to work with the development sector because they understand what it is that, you know, the, so we have, for instance, the public health perspective in this particular um, example. So we need to, even in building those partnerships, we need to first and foremost have a better understanding and acceptance of each other's strengths and weaknesses. So what is it that we can do and what is it that we can't do? We've got to have significant patient capital investment. Change doesn't happen overnight. Government support is critical. It's, in, it's, in, it's critical both for scale and to make sure that audiences' interests are, are protected. And it's important to bring in and trust the experts because there are lots of experts out there. So that's how it works, uh, finally. Um, no text messages, no literacy requirements, no special phones, no laptops, just life-saving information from the phones that people are using right now. And it's all about using appropriate media and technology. And that's really what I'd like to leave you with today. So this particular topic is, uh, is actually quite close to my heart. As a design outfit, we're usually the people in the room. 
aspects of any program, product, service, and implementation, uh, which is usually pertaining to how you know, the end user is experiencing whatever it is that you're putting out. And we use that as a means to kind of drive change in uh, the way people think about uh, you know, designing programs and so on. So I'll, I'll actually take uh, two examples. And again, thank you, uh, Santosh, for setting the stage, because one of the examples is actually uh, of your department, rural development, we, uh, the direct benefits transfer. So I wanted to call out, uh, we'd worked in that particular um, uh, sort of area with the government of AP and uh, World Bank. And the other one, of course, is sanitation. I think uh, I'd spoken, I sort of had a panel here, uh, and we've been working in sanitation for the last five years. So that's somehow a constant refrain in all my talks. Sanitation always creeps in, but that's also very close to my heart. It's an ambitious kind of pan-India effort where uh, certain social security benefits and wage payments, uh, Narega in particular, are transferred directly into people's bank accounts. Uh, the ostensible reasons for this, uh, plug leakages in an erstwhile multi-tiered system, uh, advanced financial inclusion goals, you have bank accounts for people, you're transferring money directly into their accounts, that's a big uh, opportunity to actually advance financial inclusion, and of course move forward towards the Digital India vision, right, because this whole thing is supported on an elaborate kind of system of, uh, uh, you know, so this is, uh, this is from uh, the state of Andhra Pradesh, uh, this is really your last mile agent. She's a community service provider uh, who travels and actually makes payments to beneficiaries in uh, rural and remote tribal areas. Uh, this entire system is uh, built on a network of point of transaction terminals, biometric authentication devices. Uh, there are financial providers who you know, provide the financial sort of back end to it, the systems that move money around. <laughs> Uh, and of course, the, uh, you know, the, the community service provider is really the person who sort of goes and delivers this money. Uh, a few, just three kind of examples of, uh, you know, uh, of where the system begins to break down from a last mile perspective. Uh, uh, no surprises there, but biometric authentication actually fails a lot of times. Uh, the reason? Because a lot of these, at least in tribal areas and rural areas, are... Uh, agrarian sort of populations where they have hardened calluses and biometric devices can't read that. Or uh, these are remote areas where network connectivity is not there and once you read the credentials it needs to verify. In an Aadhaar system it needs to verify uh, with a remote server. Again fails because of that. So uh, what is meant to be an electronically enabled transaction is actually uh, uh, sort of overridden through a manual system, which basically then the person actually checks a record, checks whether your name is there, and makes a payment. It's really no different than what was happening before. Again, these are anecdotal, uh, but in our sort of work with the, uh, you know, with uh, the World Bank and the government of AP, AP, this was recognized as a problem. And there are, there are, there are innumerable manual overrides in the system. Uh, uh, surprise, surprise, this money is actually carried around in bags, it's cash, which is actually transported over large uh, sort of distances by the community service provider, who's a woman in most cases, so she is accompanied, I mean, she cannot do her job unless her husband or her brother actually accompanies her and sort of takes her around all the sort of rural villages where a day in the month is uh, communicated in advance and then money is actually doled out in cash. Highly risky. Uh, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, AP actually started uh, on this sort of uh, program, the direct benefits program, at the state level in 2006. So one of the earliest states to do that. Uh, but one of the reasons why this has not really caught on and traveled to other states, because you can imagine, uh, you know, a, a situation in, say, UP, my own state, and Bihar, where these large bags of cash have to be transported and the inherent risk in doing that. Uh, and the third is that these accounts, these bank accounts, the end beneficiaries really do not have awareness of these being bank accounts. For them, these are only payment conduits, which means that as a, uh, as a Narega worker, there is a certain due that comes into the, into the account, and that needs to be withdrawn fully. So unlike a bank account that you and I own, uh, this is not something that they can keep money in or withdraw at will. It has to be done on a particular day of, of the month and has to be withdrawn fully. Now, these are all reasons why 
from an end user perspective and you know and and and, and not discounting the massive complexity that uh, you know this whole system is premised in premised on on the back end which which means you know uh, all the financial providers coming together banks kind of lining up for it uh, policy guidelines and what is the percentage that has to be kept with the bank, what has to be passed on to CSP, all of those notwithstanding, it's the end, uh, is the last mile experience that actually does not de deliver, you know, the benefit to the end beneficiary that you're looking to do. Uh, so that's one example. The other example is uh, the sanitation work that we've been doing for the last five years. Uh, this is in urban sanitation. So my experience is primarily in urban community sanitation. We've been running a pilot in uh, Bhubaneswar and Katak with the government uh, for the last sort of three years, trying to build, uh, double the community toilet infrastructure there. But again, you know, and all of us are aware of the sort of the clarion call on building infrastructure uh, to provide people basic access to sanitation. Some of the, you know, the, uh, the objectives is that a toilet would prompt people to use it. Toilets would ensure safe disposal of fecal matter. Open defecation is the biggest sort of you know, public health hazard. From a public health perspective, having kind of uh, fecal matter lying unattended, uh, not safely sort of contained and disposed is one of the biggest hazards. In the community and public toilet space, a pay-per-use model is deemed to be self-sustaining and, uh, you know, uh, and therefore that's one of the... Uh, uh, one of the three kinds of infrastructure that are being built, pu public, community, and individual toilets. Um, so, you know, again, across the country through public-private partnerships, there's a call to actually build more infrastructure, corporates sort of coming in, uh, you know, uh, and announcing 10,000 toilets that will be built in the next sort of six months, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, in our research, uh, again, of the sort of the last mile of the end user, People's reasons for open defecation is not only lack of toilet. There are households that have toilets that continue to uh, practice open defecation because the right of use for that is, uh, is, is for the vulnerable. You know, so a, um, a pregnant woman or an old sort of disabled person in the house has the right of use of that. But the men folk are actually uh, quite sort of happy going outdoors and defecating. So toilets is not going to address that problem. Uh, where you have toilets, they actually often run into disuse because of a non-existent or a dysfunctional sewage man management system. And that's one of the biggest problems right now in the cities, that a centralized sewage network is a pipe dream. Uh, and in absence of that, these toilets and fecal sludge, where would that go, is still sort of un un unattended and unaddressed. And uh, the pay-per-use model, actually, community toilets across the country have failed because one of the biggest challenges for caretakers in community toilet settings is to enforce payments by people. You know, a person who lives in that community or has been living for 15, 20 years is actually, in terms of just the power balance between him and the caretaker, who usually, you know, there's, there's sort of a caste system at play and that, you know, these caretakers are from a lower class, they, they, lower caste. There is no, uh, there's no way that it, a payment system can be enforced. And... Even from the point of view of affordability, a person paying for five people on an everyday basis is just, it's just not sustainable. Now, these are just some, uh, you know, just a thin slice of some of the last mile issues that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, so sort of going back to that point about how do we move from designing pa pilots in the way that they have to, rather than leaving them to accident, uh, so as a prom proponent of human-centered design as a process and practice, I'm here to kind of present just a framework for that. I feel that this is, uh, I'm kind of possibly naive in thinking that this can, uh, you know, this has the power to really uh, push the needle on having more effective systems in, uh, on the ground. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave you with just three kind of uh, aspects of this which I think uh, you know, we can speak uh, more at length uh, in sort of the discussion or at the break after this. But the first is that understand end user experience, un understand experience, right? And there is absolutely no substitute to spending time in the field. It doesn't matter. And you know, I think it's, it's something that you'd probably kind of be able to reflect on in your own sort of uh, practices. But the higher you move up, the more disconnected you are from ground realities. And that's what we keep telling. That's what we 
uh, you know, when we're working with institutions is we bring people out in the field and we have them sort of spend time with us understanding because it's important to formulate your own hypothesis about what will work or not. I mean, treat that as, you know, don't treat research as a, a thing that you commission. Treat research as a part of your practice and a part of your skill set. It has to be. Uh, the second is co-creating solutions. Again, a, you know, an often used, abused word, but the point is that you have to involve all stakeholders at the very early stages of actually conceptualizing solutions. That part, that part of the process is extremely messy. Uh, you'll have cynics in the room. You'd, you'll have extreme ambiguity. You, know, you walk into settings where, you, where people, people don't know what they're in that room for, but learn to live with that ambiguity because that's a part where once you have stakeholders in the room, they'd be able to speak from their positions of strength and bring certain, certain perspectives in. So co-creating solutions is sort of time out. But that's the third one, which is make prototyping and testing a continuous process. Now, this is something that has to move out of domain of pilots only. You know, For us, as a design practice, we believe that prototyping and testing is a part of, it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're at a pilot stage or you're in a full-blown implementation. Unless you have the spirit of prototyping, prototyping and testing as an integral part of the DNA of your, uh, you know, of your business or your program, you're not allowing yourself to change and make course corrections. And you know, there are enough examples if you sort of look at the startup boom and of uh, you know, uh, e-commerce ventures that have gone on to become big. They look nothing like what they were at a Series A stage or where, when they were sort of raising the first corpus of fund. They've changed dramatically. And that's, that's how you know, programs, policies, product services have to be. They have to transform. And for that, prototyping and testing has to be a part of your, uh, of your process. So these are sort of just, uh, th I mean, these, this is the framework on which human-centered design is premised. And uh, we feel it's a, it's a really important sort of framework to think about the last mile.